defense vehicles and stuff. But to see that, that was kind of neat. And yeah, they've been doing they've been doing similar things. Uh, Sydney's graduation was similar to that too. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, trying to make it as special as they can under current circumstances, I guess. All right, everyone. We're not we're not exactly on a schedule here, but I did just hit record, um, and I'm gonna I'm also gonna fire up the live to Facebook, um, but. Uh, Whenever we want to get started, we can. Like I said, we're not we're not on a schedule here. I'm just letting everyone know that I'm starting to share. I like how you strategically put that turkey picker. Gotta change it to deer now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you could put one over your left shoulder, deer. If I got a deer one I can swap out right now. Oh, there you go. Where have you been hiking, Brett? Brett? Uh, all over. Uh, Moose Mountain, Little Scutney. I made it up to that saddle that I kind of looked at at that map when we were up there. And then uh, yep. just, hiked, just hiked by my house today. Awesome. Nice. There's a couple spots on National Forest I've been eyeballing on my drive home that I want to check out just to take a walk up and see. I get there's a couple roads that I did uh, some investigating on Onyx that uh, you can drive out. There must be some parking points that you can stop at, and there's a bunch of trails. So figured it'd be. Nice hike to get out and learn some new area up that way. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to uh, see if we can do some tracking if we get any snow this fall. I'm feeling motivated to uh, uh, at least give it a try on a weekend here and there. Of course, that means you, I'm gonna uh, have to you. not shoot the first buck that walks by. I guess. Are you streaming this on your Facebook page? Who? Mike. Yeah, I'm setting it up right now. Okay. We're just going to try to share it here. On you guys sharing yeah, any of this on, you know, Brett, Morgan, anybody else? You guys, Brent, you guys. Feel I do free know. To share the, this, I do know. Last time, off of them on the Facebook. I do know. Last time when I shared it, people that were making comments on my link weren't getting uh, their comments weren't being picked up by um, the main conversation. That's just the only thing about that. Yeah, if you notice anything, we may just have to bring them up. The only thing I'm curious about, would I have to exit out to be able to go in and share it? Because I'm doing this off of my iPhone. You should be able to minimize it, but don't don't try it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll do it after. How about that? Hey, is there a Trout Unlimited page that I can tag to this? Uh, I can certainly just say to you, but if I can actually tag to a social account, I'd like to. Um, do you want to tag um, like a Facebook page you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, you could try to tag the Vermont Council Facebook page. Um, let me check. We tagged um, the Mad River uh, TU chapter, but I don't know if that was the right chapter. Mad, to yeah, the Mad Dog TU chapter. Yeah, Mad Dog yeah. TU, yeah. Yeah, you could... Um, uh, Michael, you could tag that one too, because that's the that's the lo the logo that we sent you is for that for our chapter. So you could do that one too if you want. All right, let's see if I can track that down. You should be able to find it on Facebook. Is that coming up? I did. I, yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got just got a um, pop up on the, on the Zoom um, 
app that says meeting is now streaming on live on Facebook. So um, what the I like it. All right, I, I think that we're live. I see it now. It's up in the right hand corner. Perfect. Great. If, if people see questions, uh, don't don't be afraid to toss them out. I don't think we're all going to see everything that shows up on the socials, however that looks. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. VHA, TU, NWTF, Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Um, good stuff. Turkey season's wrapped up. Trout season's rolling. Deer season's in the way off in the headlights, but it's out there. Um, so we'll talk tonight a little bit about turkey season lesson lear lessons learned, um, trout tactics for from beginners to maybe experts, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about what's coming up for fish and wildlife events coming down the road, especially for new hunters. Um, so that's that's the plan. First things first, Great American Outdoors Act passed the Senate yesterday. Woohoo! Everyone take a drink if you're if you're drinking. It's a pint night. Um, I would encourage everyone who's watching, whether it's now or down the road, to write your representative in the House of Representatives or call the congressional switchboard and um, ask them to support this. Um, we're not done yet. We celebrated yesterday. We'll, we'll push forward from here and then uh, hopefully get this on the president's desk sometime before the 4th of July. Um, huge, huge, huge conservation move, so. And I'll, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but also thank your senators. I, I believe that right. every senator in New England, uh, with exception from one out of Massachusetts, who didn't vote against but, uh, but wasn't present for the vote, um, voted in support of the Great American Outdoors Act, which is, which is something uh, certainly for us here in this region to celebrate. Um, and to make sure that they know that we're celebrating that, that decision that they, you know, that they supported. Yeah, so that's, that's good stuff. Um, let's, let's keep that rolling. Big, huge event for conservation. So uh, probably the biggest in our generation. So that'll be good. Um, all right, who's got a turkey? Turkey lesson learned story to share, good, bad, or otherwise. <laughs> We're kind of quiet. I guess, I, I, I guess I you guess guys I already could, know I everything. I, <laughs> I guess I. Can run with that one. Uh, um, running with my season um i can't ever say it was a terrible season it was a good season uh the couple things that i noticed were in the woods um birds didn't seem to have to have the purpose to be in the fields as much as normal um i probably this year uh, i had a harder time this year than i have in many years past of roosting birds in the evening to hunt the next morning um which is not, is not a huge problem if you do your pre-scouting, but uh, I had a couple of unfortunate instance, uh, instances this year. Uh, I had a misfire with uh, one of my shotguns, so that was uh, um, a lesson learned. Uh, I don't know, I haven't dug into it too, too much to see if it was actually the firing pin or if it was the shell, but I really do think that it was the firing pin, and I don't know if it was because the spring was weak or if I just needed to dig a little deeper into cleaning the firing pin on the gun, but um, that cost me a nice bird. Um, and then I also, uh, I had a miss a couple of days later <laughs> with um, a shot that I'm not used to using. It's actually a dear friend of ours. Uh, at the time, I did not know that the gun shot a little high. So <laughs> that, uh, that was another lesson learned. Make sure you have all the information first, but um, I did have success later on in the season with that shotgun, so that was this pretty pretty special hunt for me. Was that a good kickoff? That's a great kickoff. Uh, I've heard a lot about this shotgun. Is someone willing to give a, a little bit of a story about it and the and the fellow that it belonged to? I believe his name was Phil, correct? 
Correct. Yes. Um, I guess I'll do that. And then if the guys want to join in after. Um, Phil Salzano uh, is a friend of ours. He actually started our uh, local chapter of the NWTF here in White River. Um, him and, and three or four other of us uh, started the chapter. Um, Phil's well known in the turkey calling community. Uh, finished third in gobbling, I think it was, uh, in 2019. Uh, 2019. And um, uh, lost his battle to uh, cancer last last october um mm. and and uh f the th four of us yep brent's got a picture of him up up there now holding the f holding the trout which was another thing he loved to do was trout trout fish too so he was uh he, he guided turkey hunts and, and and trout fishing out in utah for for a year or two as well um not that long ago uh and and ken jones who's not on the i don't think he's on this call but he's he's a good friend of ours as well. Um, on and uh, the four of us kind of decided that we wanted to give a uh, give Phil's memory uh, um, one more hunt. He wanted one more hunt, is what he what he had told Ken. And um, Ken Ken was able to use that shotgun last fall to to harvest a, a fall bird. And then I think Brent was the first one up this year to uh, get get a bird down in Massachusetts. Um, I shot it, my, I missed one with it in New Hampshire and then ended up, uh, shooting one in Vermont with it. And then I handed it over to Morgan and Morgan just told his story with it. So we were able to honor our friend that way. And, um, I don't think it's done yet, but for this turkey season, it's obviously over, but I, I I'm hoping we can continue to uh, honor him in that way. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, guys. That's pretty special. Um, and I think it speaks to the, uh, the depths to which um, people connect with the outdoors and with each other through, through the pursuits we lead. So, um, pretty powerful stuff. Um, all right, Brent, I'm going to call on you. What lessons did you learn this year? And, and maybe specify something that would help a new hunter, new turkey hunter. As far as lessons learned go, uh, I don't know as I've ever had a season go so good. <laughs> um, there was there was nothing this year that made me feel like a beginner. It, it felt like all my years of experience all played out into perfection this year. Um, um boy i don't really how about the last day is as good as the first day brent yeah it's def yeah definitely uh the the don't don't <laughs> give up sure. yeah don't don't give up because uh the last day was just as good as the first day the i shot a bird in new york on the very last day of season and it was it was just like it was opening day they were they were gobbling and the uh just the foliage was different but they were still active and um, they had been, they were pressured birds, but um, we just got in the right position to, to get in, uh, get them to come into where we, where they wanted, they were comfortable, where the turkeys were comfortable. It was two long beards and a jake. And there were some fields down below us and we were up on a ridge in the uh, timber. And uh, I think they were more comfortable being up on that ridge than they were down, headed down to the field. So, um, don't don't give up for sure this this a long season Thir 31 days if of a month and there's plenty of time to have some action so what y'all think were you guys seeing more more hunters in the woods than you do in a normal year you know i know that the thinking going into the season was man there's going to be you know all these new hunters or guys with more time off and stuff did you guys ever find you know interference with with hunters to be more of an issue this year than in past years uh, I I know in my area I certainly saw more people, but but uh, in there in the area I live with live in I don't know if it was uh, I think it was people just going out to try because they had the extra time to do it this spring and uh, something that I've noticed around this area is usually after that first week 
the, or the first, the first, the second, the second weekend, you start to see those numbers drop off. I don't know if it's just because people have filled their tags or, or people start disliking the getting up so early in the morning. Um, but I definitely saw a lot more new vehicles parked in spots that I've never seen. Not affect, in my opinion, it did not affect the birds the way that I would have imagined it to. Um, I definitely know that the birds were a lot more talkative this year than they were last year. So that, that was definitely one big thing that I noticed. Um, when you did get on a bird that was goblin, you had a pretty good opportunity um, with a little bit of experience, of experience that uh, you might have a chance at harvesting him. I, I would agree with most of most of what Morgan said. I didn't I didn't see too many more people out, but I do think that uh, um, late in the week, like usually, if you have a hunt a Thursday, Friday, there's not as much competition. And this year, it seemed to be more spread out. That there was people out there even in the middle of the week. Um, I didn't have any interference as far as where I hunted. Um, and the birds definitely were more uh, responsive to calling this year than than uh, definitely last year. I, I, I attribute that to the fact that there was a bunch of two-year-olds on the on the landscape and they were out there uh, competing with uh, with each other for the hands. But I don't know how factual that is. That's just my personal uh, anecdotal observation, I guess. I don't, I don't think of the weather. It was uh, it was a bit of a bit of a treat this year. <laughs> we had quite a weather span, really. It snowed and freezing cold and a little bit of rain. And then by the end of the season, we were hunting in uh, 80, 90 degree weather a couple of days. So we covered it all in, in May. That's what I love about May is you never know what you're going to get. This was interesting. For This is the first year I ever had somebody jump out of their car and shoot from the road at a bird I was calling in. Which, you know, honestly, I saw a ton of guys, like you were asking. It's, all, uh, my, it's all my go-to spots that I hunt, I saw a pile of people more than just about any year, but I decided to jump in my truck and drive out to um, the Berkshires, the Mass, and uh, ended up getting some phenomenal new private access and ended up not only having a great turkey season, plus I was on the border of New York, so I was able to bounce back and forth. I got some great new deer spots, so it was like a tale of two seasons. Early, I was frustrated, and then late, I was like, man, I'm having a hell of a season, so I just put a lot of work in, but that whole shooting from the road thing was kind of interesting, you know? I was like, come on, man, you know? So. Yeah. That Western Mass area is beautiful, beautiful country too. It's pretty here, yeah, really is. Uh, we have a decent number of birds, but there was quite a few guys in the woods, like, uh, like I was saying. So Jeff, were you able to? I know in Massachusetts, it was the first year of of having that option of uh, of filling a second tag without giving up your fall tag. You know, is that um, how'd that work out for you? Yeah, I've been really on a hot streak every year. I'm usually tagged out pretty early, so I uh, then I just don't hunt any turkeys in the fall because I'm really focused on uh, focused on deer. I mean, and I could have shot two in the same morning, but I didn't feel like I would enjoy that. So I wanted to not. I'd rather stretch out my season, you know. So I didn't care about that two in the same day thing. Um, but I mean. You know, honestly, I think there was not even as many birds this year as prior years. So I, I wasn't sure how they come up with that. Is it certain areas they have surveys and then they kind of apply that what they think to the whole state? Or but I think my area, I feel like we didn't have the same number of birds because usually I spend a lot of time scouting. I just wasn't seeing the numbers in, in um, my part. I'm like in the Connecticut River Valley here, Western Mass. So I, I don't know if anybody can comment how they just determine how they determine to up the ante, if you will, you know. Well, you know, without without having anybody from from Mass Wildlife there, you know, I don't want to comment too much, but I think that, you know, if you've looked at at harvest over the last few years, it's been, you know, stable to increasing um, for any, you know, number of those years. And honestly, during the spring, when you're targeting those male birds. Um, 
you know, as long as the timing of your season is after um, the, the peak of nest initiation, you can really um, harvest a lot of birds without impacting the long-term sustainability of the population and That's stuff. So, you know, I think, I wondering that. yeah, and I, I think a lot of, you know, I think even in Massachusetts was the same as in, in Vermont was just, you know, a tremendous mast year over the winter and stuff. So I think the patterns of those birds going into spring was different than normal. I live, I personally live in, in probably similar to you do in the Connecticut Valley and stuff. And uh, um, definitely was noticing less birds going into the season, but I think they were still there. I think they were, had just, were deeper in the woods personally. Um, I did just that. get a question. I don't know if we want to touch on this, but uh, Tyler asked uh, how everybody made out during the snow day this year? I was out, I froze my rear end off. I didn't dress for it. I didn't see a damn thing. And uh, I was like, wait a minute, are we deer not now? What's going on? <laughs> but it, you know, I still enjoyed being out in the snow, but if I was dressed better, I would have enjoyed it a little more. But I, I didn't hear things really quiet that day. Uh, didn't see any. I like to try to track them if I get lucky and have snow just to see what's around. And I think they were pretty much not moving in my area that that snow day there. I, I actually called the Jake in on that snow day, um, but it was up in the morning and, yeah. and we didn't have we didn't have as much snow uh, where I'm at, where I'm at in the Wet River Junction area as as some locations did. But we did have snow on the ground and um, I, I think it was about 11 o'clock, 1130, maybe I struck that bird. I uh, got close to him. I think you had to get close to him on that, on that, those days. Uh, I think it was windy the same day that it snowed too. So it was hard, hard to hear. And, and if you get in their bubble, um, it's breeding season. So I think they're going to come to the call, whether there's snow on the ground or not. So. I'd agree on that. Um, we, uh, the one thing that I noticed is exactly what, Brett said yeah. on days when the weather is like that, especially I, I don't think it affects them so much. Uh, they're still going to do their behaviors uh, as far as the breeding season behaviors. They may be a little bit more quiet, but um, my girlfriend Sam and I actually got on a bird. Um, we were actually headed from one spot to another and happened to spot this bird out on a piece of property. So we made a plan and um, we worked out around and we actually got within about a hundred yards of that bird and he also had five hens about 60 yards and there was a big log that had fallen down into the field from uh from the edge of the woods and he would come up and he'd strut in front of that log just on the other side of it and i couldn't quite see him but i could hear his rumbling in his chest every time he spit and drum but my girlfriend could see him and i could see her like her body reactions and i i finally said to her I'm like can you see him and he she's like he's right there he's just a little too far and of course the log happened to be there but he got man he had to gobble 200 to 300 times that morning <laughs> and he was goblin and everything but as said before we were in his bubble we had got in his comfort zone to where he was comfortable enough to make some noise because as soon as soon as his hens broke out of the field because they didn't really want anything to do with me uh, they field and got back with them and they ended up taking off and after about he got out of that 100 yard range he uh he ended up uh, just going quiet Sounds like fun anyways. Yeah, it's always fun. <laughs> oh, man. Pretty, pretty cool. All right, let's oh, switch gears. Am I still a little laggy or can everybody hear me all right? You're, You're a little laggy, laggy but it, we'll, it we'll was, wait for your trout story. <laughs> it, was, it, was a fun, it was a fun morning session. The, what, the one... Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. I just... Yeah, okay. Uh, the, the one thing that I always do do when I'm in the woods for when I'm turkey hunting, I'm always scouting for other species while I'm there too. I don't just specifically hunt turkeys. I'm always looking for something else. Uh, one thing 
we noticed this year is uh, I think we counted like anywhere from 10 to 15 partridge this year. And that's not normal for us around here. So I think they did very well with the past or gr grouse per se. That's cool. Yeah, I saw a pile of deer this year more than normal. I think we're going to, feels like there's more, I saw more than typical, you know, so hopefully that's kind of a good sign. I definitely think it is. I've seen more grouse on the roads and in the woods than I have in a couple of years. So um, hopefully all the little ones make it to the fall. We can get after them in October. Uh, let's switch gears to trout. Corey and Clark, I'm gonna lean on you guys. Um, Paul's on the call. He knows how rough I had it a week and a half ago, floating the Connecticut River, trying to do fancy things with fly rods. There must be an easier way to catch trout, Corey. <laughs> there is. So, Clark, if I'm correct, you usually fish with fly rods, correct? Mainly? Mostly, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's perfect because I, I do very little fly fishing when I go trout fishing. No, you can uh, first. Out with, I, I prefer either just going with a stream or a spin, a spin cast rod or, or drifting a worm. Uh, so there's really two, two different approaches you can take to it. Lay yeah. on us, Corey. What's the approach? Yeah, yeah. Get us here. Get, give us the bait guy's perspective here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it just depends on how, how complicated you want to get into it, really. Uh, this time of year, I mean, I basically have just been uh, worm drifting. Uh, so going into like small, small, tiny streams and just walking for long strength and just drifting a worm uh, into, you know, pools and rocks, the same areas that Clark would be drifting, just using a worm, drifting it just with a small BB sinker. So you're going to get hung up a lot. Uh, you're just trying to get it to bounce enough around. Uh, so no bob or anything like that. And then just an ultra light rod. And that's all it takes. Yeah. So are you, um, um, so are you casting upstream, downstream? You court, or like how do you how do you? Set? Yeah, so I'd be basically I'd be walking upstream, so casting upstream as I go. Okay, and then keeping a tight line on it as it's coming yeah. back. Okay, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, fairly similar to what you would be doing fly fishing, but just using spin casting gear. Yeah, I mean, I think people who are interested in you know doing a little bit of both. Um, I, I saw a guy years ago fish the up uh, the J branch um, with this really long. It was an aluminum rod, um, and he was—he um, had just a little bit of, of shot on it and a little bit of worm. And this guy went through this ledge pool, and I think probably he may have—he probably took five or six trout out of there. I mean, they were nice trout. I mean, you know, they were probably seven to nine inch trout, and you know, so he was going pretty deep. But it was just a, a beautiful technique because it—you know—he had this nice kind of just enough pressure on the on the line so that he could detect those strikes and yeah. you know that when you know when fly anglers are, are nymph fishing you know and, and, and going upstream or even you know that the kind of the, the thing that, that is kind of big in the fly angling community right now is um, like what they call euro nymphing and you know and mostly it's very very similar it's almost identical Corey to what you're doing you know it's just there's very little fly line out in fact most of the guys have like 30 uh, well not 30 but 20 to 25 feet a liter um small very small nymphs um you know uh fairly slender um sometimes weighted and they do the same thing that you're doing you know they're casting upstream keeping a you know uh, some pressure on the line and detecting strikes that way, you know, it's very similar. Oh, yeah. yeah, actually the fishing's been, I don't know about you, but fishing's been great down this way over in like the Rutland County area. Uh, been doing really well. Mostly brook trout, Corey? Yeah, mostly brookies and browns. Uh, so a few rainbows here and there, uh, but a lot of the brookies have been fairly large. Uh, so I got up in the National Forest last week and got a brookie that was probably around 16 inches or so. Uh, oh, Worth the walk. It was a one. <laughs> that fish still to get into that one. But yeah, there's been there's been some good fish this year. Yeah. What uh, what size hook do you use, Corey, when you're fishing worms? Yeah. Uh, so I use usually size ten. It's a little size ten bait holder, and then just a small BB size sinker basically is all I would use, about eight inches up. Eight inches up. Using an ultra light rod so that you can actually get it and cast it out there. Because otherwise, with any other rod, you're not going to be able to move that as you go to cast. Yeah. You've got like a, some people like when they first get started, uh, 
a couple of my friends that go out, they'll use bobbers just to get themselves up and there's nothing wrong with that. If it helps you get a little less snags, you're still catching fish. That's perfectly fine. Um, so you're, uh, what was I going to ask? Um, do you, how much, how much bait do you have, do you have on when you're, when you're fishing? Yeah, usually half a worm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just a small amount, uh, beginning of the season, I'll put on a little more. Uh, so usually find they, they bite a little bit harder if we get in, begin in the year. So I might put on one or two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a bigger chunk of worm is the beginning. Do you hook it? Uh, I worm. got a question for you. Is it, uh, are you hooking fish with night crawlers or just? No, not night crawlers. So usually just small, small little trout worms. Or, gotcha. I mean, it'd be trout worms, you bought them at the store, but honestly, I just go out of my backyard and whatever happens to be under the log. Yeah, cool. When we, long time ago, when I used to throw bait, we would hook a crawler, but it would be half a crawler, but just most of the head of the crawler is hanging off the hook, so it would spin in the current, if you know what I mean. Like, you're not hooking it in the middle, just on the tail end, so you got a lot of, it's just, I, I mean, it's got to be very enticing as that thing's getting a lot of action in the current, you know. Um, I mean, stalkers, you know, they, they can't not hit that, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, can you can you use those yeah. fishing tactics um later into the summer and stuff as the water's warmed up and oh, that yeah. sort of thing? Yeah, I'll use with... that year round. Uh okay. or not year not year round, not not as we talked, but uh, you know, as as the season progresses and the waters warm up. Uh basically as the summer goes on, I'll start moving uh into more like deeper pools. The same thing that you would do if you're fly fishing or any other type of fishing deeper pools I'll put on a couple extra sinkers to get yourself down uh, whereas right now you can go into some of those smaller flows and kind of let it drift through as the summer progresses you're not going to be able to do that the sinker just won't get down to where you need it to be or you'll probably start catching a lot of other species or something like too, that right? which I was using the other night with some luck in the summer you must be picking up a lot of other different species as the water warms up too oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah so you get a lot of like creek jobs and things like that doing it that way yeah, yeah, that's fine. So you get a lot, of, a lot of miscellaneous fish thrown in there too with, with your brookies that you're trying to catch. Mixed bag, yeah. Yeah. So, Corey, it sounds like you've done mostly upland streams with, so far, or have you um, gone down to any of some of the, the larger rivers? That, or I haven't really fished any any of the larger rivers. Okay. Uh, mainly, I mean, the biggest river I fished so far this year would be the Castleton, which really isn't all that big. Right. Okay. So, sort uh, of but I've gone up into like beaver bogs, those type of areas a bit. Um, okay. Your smaller streams. What about you? Have you been on the, the larger rivers this year? Or? Um, not much. I fished the Winooski um, and picked up some stockfish a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had um, a really, well, a reasonably good year on the on uh, Lewis Creek um, in the spring. I got a uh, seven to eight pound steelhead um, back in April, which surprised the, I mean, you know, you just don't, I mean, it's almost seeing a steelhead in most nice. these days that big is almost unheard of. And um, it really, it just shocked me when, when I got it, I thought, I had no idea what it was when, when I got it. I thought, God, what was this? It wasn't a bass. It wasn't a bass way too early for a bass. I, I'd fall fish maybe, I don't know, but uh, yeah, it turned out to be a really, really nice steelhead. Um, so, you know, like, you know, Lewis is a little bigger than Castleton, but you know, um, and you know the one one of the things that's happening um, for us around here is that the little river gets the bottom release from Waterbury Reservoir, so that river stays cold. I was out Sunday. Sunday was a pretty chilly day. The water temp was fifty, mm. and the and there were three different hatches going on. There were two mayflies and, and a caddisfly coming off, and what happened there in you know, I, I know that it's a risk talking about, talking about extremes, but um, I think you have to, you know, the Little River, I think right now is producing wild rainbows. Um, and it also gets the stockfish that, that are put in Waterbury and, and, they, uh, and they go up there for refuge. And, they're, and they'll definitely be coming in now with this heat wave that's going on. Um, so they'll, they'll go up there. But, you know, I think the real good news there is that despite the turbidity because of the the clay uh, landslide that happened in the water, water here, um, that um, 
you know, we're getting natural reproduction of rainbows in there. Um, and it's, it's challenging river to fish. Um, you know, it gets the constant flow um, and there's a fair amount of bug life in there. There's a lot of woody debris, but it's really, there's a lot of tricky currents. Uh, there's a lot of ledges. Uh, there's not a lot of kind of traditional <clears throat> um, riffle pool kind of structure. There's some ledges in there. Uh, and the canopy is really low. So as a fly angler, it's, <laughs> I think I lost four flies that day. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, um, you know, um, and right now I, I went out, I live uh, just across the street from the Mad River here in Moortown. And um, I took temperature readings on four different spots of the Mad River today. And the, and the lowest temperature I found was 72 degrees. Now that was at probably... I think that was around two or two thirty. So it's kind of maximum heating time during the course of the day. But um, that's what Corey. That's why I asked you about where you've been going because um, you know if you're going to take fish. I mean, if you're going out and looking for stockfish and you want to take them home, you know that's great. I mean, go out and catch them. You know, whether regardless of what the, the water temperature is. But if you hook into a trout in seventy five degree water. You know, there's that fish is is toast anyway, so to speak. So you might as well bring them home. Um, but the upland streams, Corey, like you've been having yeah, good the water. So the one I didn't bring. A, I was also one of the mountains yesterday, and I didn't bring a temperature with me. But I stepped in, and it was it was not 70 degrees. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Mad River here warms up really fast. Um, it's it doesn't have much of a canopy during the the middle part of the um, of the river. So if you're you know if you guys live around areas where you know, it's really exposed just, you know, and you're conscious if you don't always want to take, you know, uh, if you're, you're going to release some fish, just be cautious of, um, you know, being aware. And, and I think it's really important to, to carry a thermometer with you, you know, again, unless you're, you know, fishing for the pot most of the time, which is great. Um, but you just have to be cautious and, you know, you don't want to um, think you're going to, you know, let a fish go if it's, you know, above 70. They're just, the, the chances of them making it are pretty slim. Um, but, you know, the other, uh, oh, the other thing too, and, and uh, Matt, I don't know this, if you've heard anything about this or anyone else that's on this, uh, that may be up in the kingdom, but one of our members is up in Canaan fishing right now, and the Connecticut is, is 51 yesterday in Canaan, which is pretty crazy, but there's a huge uh, bloom of Didymo. Oh, really? And if you guys don't know, Didymo is, is basically this mossy kind of crap that um, blooms in conditions like we're having now. If you've got low clear water and not much of a canopy and a lot of dry days and a lot of sun, if your river is infested with didymo, you're going to get, and it'll cover the, the entire bottom of the stream. Um, it'll, it'll be like a blanket um, coming across. And um, the White River has didymo, Mad River has didymo, um, the Connecticut obviously does. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone else on the call has um, either seen any of this or happens to happen to be in, in, uh, in areas where they've seen blooms before. I've, I've seen some before, and I thought there was some debate as to whether it was a, a native event or some sort of invasive. And that's where the felt waiter limitations came from. But then those went away, as far as I know. Yeah, they did. You can fish, you know, you can wear felt soles now. Um, you know, my, you know, I have a, um, you know, there, there is a professor at Dartmouth who claims that Didymo is, is a native species and has always been around. Um, I have my, you know, I, 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 I'm somewhat skeptical about that. You know, I guess one of, and, you know, I'd be curious about what else people have heard, but I, my sense is that, you know, when you see this stuff, people tend to talk about it, you know, and, and when we had it before, you know, we get some media attention, people are talking about what's going on in the river, so on and so forth. Um, and I've asked people that, well, okay, so if Didymo is native, so why aren't there just anecdotal or, you know, some sort of evidence of people talking about this in the past? Because when it happens, it's really dramatic. I mean, you, you your stream, your river changes a lot. Um, having said that, there is relatively, there's, some evidence that Didymo is, other than being a nuisance and kind of like if you're fishing and you're always taking this crap off your fly or your hook, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily change what's available for the trout, though that 
also was somewhat open for debate. But anyway, Corey, I don't know. Well, yeah, so one of, one of our biologists could probably explain it better, but my, my than what I can, but I'll, I'll go off of basically what I've been told. And my understanding with it is kind of what, what, along the lines of what you were saying, whereas initially when we initiated the law for household waders was the understanding that it was an invasive species. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, they found spores that basically proved that it was actually a native species, or that was the understanding of it. So based on that knowledge that we're now realizing that Ditmo was here the whole time and is no longer an invasive species, they repealed it. Yeah, yeah. And um, there may be more to that. That's just my, my understanding of it. And I'm sure one of our biologists could go a little bit more into detail. You know, and you have to wonder what, how climate change might be affecting those blooms, right? Because, mm -hmm perhaps with all of the, the warming that's going on, we're getting bigger and bigger blooms of them, whereas before they weren't, weren't as much of a, weren't as, wasn't as much of an issue. Yeah, well, that could be true because, you know, when you think back into the 1800s and early 1900s, because of the deforestation, a lot of the streams were probably pretty muddy. Um, you know, the, the, the Winooski obviously has, you know, Didymo flowing into it, but Though there most likely won't be blooms there just because of the nature of the, of the water. I mean, that's why the white tends to bloom because it's very clear. Uh, mm -hmm. And other rivers are, you know, less prone to that. You know, like the Winus, like I said, the Winus will never have blooms most likely, um, but uh, others will. Yeah. All right, Clark, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you had to go out tomorrow and catch a trout, what fly are you putting on and how are you fishing it? Oh, wow. If I was going to go out tomorrow, well, um, if I was to go into the stream, I would probably put on a, um, probably about a number 10 or 12 atoms or an irresistible if I was going to go up in, you know, some of the upland streams and, and you'll catch, you know, boatloads of trout and have a great time. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll be, they're looking up, um, upland trout or, you know, they're hungry. They're always looking to eat. Um. If I was, if I was, I would probably, if I was going to go into the bigger rivers, I'd either go really early in the morning. Um, I, I don't think it would be, uh, rivers will be running more and well into the evening. I wouldn't necessarily go at dark, but I'd go early in the morning. Um, and not many people are lucky enough to have bottom release reservoir rivers around Vermont, but um, if I was going to go into, or the Little River or something like that, um, well, I'd probably put on a scout. And if, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a, um, a sparkly, um, you know, lots of sparkle, um, some hen feathers, um, and a little red um, thread around the top, and it's, built, and it's on a jig hook. So, and you can either fish it downstream or upstream. And, and I have friends of mine who fish it up and it's deadly. Um, you know, I fished it once in the upper Connecticut um, and I saw four trout this sort of like beat one another to death trying to get at this thing um and it's kind of uh you know it's it's um it's very baby look you know it's it's kind of you know i think that's one of the things that looks very um enticing and and you know it's it's, it's always sort of bobbing up and down in the stream so anyway so that's what i do that's good Corey. i think i know what you you put on but but give a give me a give me a run <laughs> i mean honestly I'm the other day I went up into uh, basically a beaver bog and I was just throwing uh, spinners. Uh, frankly, uh, didn't have any worms, so threw a spinner on. It was doing really well with that. And really embarrassing, but I had a good 16 inch or so, probably bigger, honestly, brookie. So a really nice brookie. And we've been doing a lot of filming type stuff for work. I was like, oh, this will be a great opportunity for me to film catching a brookie. So I pulled out the phone. I'm trying to film it while I reel it in. And no sooner as I go to break that thing up, it falls right off the line, right in front of me. So I got, I got me losing a fish on film. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was a really nice fish. Was, oh, that was, I, sh I should. You've got to keep that. Focused on the fish, but yeah. you've gotta, you, they're, bigger, they're always bigger when you lose them. Yeah. <laughs> like the you got to keep that for like a blooper reel or something, Corey. Or might just cut it before you lose it, and that's the. <laughs> That's, that's, yeah. No, that's unrealistic. Come on. <laughs> Realism here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, tomorrow if I was to go out, either a spinner or just, just a worm in a small stream, like Clark was saying, 
Uh, what are you using for spinners? Fairly warm, so I mean, I have the same problems that Clark would have with going out fishing, no matter what you're using. Uh, whether I'm whether you're going with a fly or a worm, uh, the waters are still still really warm, or because you're getting low too. So like the best day I had this year, uh, I put a kayak in the Castleton when the water was a little bit higher and paddled down it a ways to sections where honestly it looks like nobody ever goes. And once you get in a ways, the fishing was just phenomenal. But you can't get a kayak down now. There's no way you could paddle down. Yeah. yeah. You guys could always just pack up your gear and head down to Cape Cod and jump in the canal and start hitting those big striped bass now, man. <laughs> that does sound nice. <laughs> if you really want to do something weird with a fly rod or any kind of rod, is, is uh, find some place that's got both in and go have yourself a blast. Because um, unless you've caught, you know, one, you know, our version of the snakehead, um, you have you have fish, man. You got you got well, I've been hearing a lot of people actually going after carp with a fly rod and having a lot of fun with that. Going after carp? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Drew yeah, Price. That sounds appealing for me. I mean, that's a that sounds like a fun fun fight. Yeah, I mean, there's I mean, there's guys that that are out there, you know, targeting carp and getting you know twenty five thirty. I mean, Drew had one on yesterday, I think. It took him an hour to land the darn thing. Um, I've had them on. They're like freshwater bonefish. They, they, they will peel off line faster than you can imagine. It's just incredible. What are they catching them on with a fly rod? Oh, man, that's the thing. It's like you never know. Um, you know, there are guys that um, – Tom Rosenbauer from Orvis was talking about fishing for them in the Hudson, and they have a fly that, that mimics mulberry seeds. <laughs> yeah. Because they'll stand under, they'll, they'll be underneath mulberry bushes and they'll eat them as they plop into the water. Mulberries, um, woolly buggers. Yeah. Snap, you know, what you, what kind of about, because uh, like if you go out regular, if you're just using regular gear, corn is what people would use a lot. Yeah. Of. yeah. Fly yeah, that looks like corn. Looks like corn. A couple corn kernels tied onto a fly. Yeah. Yeah, almost anything. Hey, uh, they're, they're, they will eat anything. Um, but hey, are your campgrounds open up there yet? Do you guys know your state campgrounds? Because ours are shut down still. They were going to open up the 21st and they pushed it back till July 1st because of the COVID deal. I, I feel like they're opening up July 1st, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, check the website. I yeah, know, I know they've, been, they've been working a lot and I think they're going to open with some restrictions, but I'm yeah. not sure what exactly what those restrictions are but they i know that they state parks worked really hard on their like covid procedure page on our state parks vermont state parks website so right all right nicole don't mute your mute yourself let's let's get into what's coming up for hunter's ed great so as you guys know hunter education uh in-person classes have been suspended since COVID, um, but we're gonna, we, we've been authorized to restart back up with in-person stuff July 1. So we're really excited. Um, we're probably not gonna offer a course on July 1st, <laughs> but, uh, but we're gonna start slowly offering in-person stuff. So we're, we're excited about that. There will be a lot of COVID restrictions. Everyone's gonna need to be wearing masks, um, staying six feet apart, you know, washing hands, sanitizing equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But besides just the regular certification classes, we're really excited that this year we're gonna start um, like a mentor meet and greet program where new hunters can come to a half day session where they'll meet um, hunting mentors who are um, trained by and vetted by us. And then uh, they'll go out for our brand new novice weekend, which runs the same weekend as youth weekend, um, but is for new adult hunters. So we're really excited about that program. We don't have the dates for it yet. Um, we're still really in the planning stages for it. But if you know someone who's a new adult hunter, um, you know, definitely shoot them my way. Uh, we're, we're looking for people who want to mentor new hunters and we're looking for for new hunters who who need a a mentor so we're really excited about that and one of a few of our men the mentors that i've identified are on this call right now like brett ledoux and paul noel <laughs> well paul is muted i don't know if he can hear me but um yeah yeah i think it's gonna be um i think it's gonna be a lot of fun and i think that the mentor program is going to be especially important considering um, we didn't have any in-person classes this spring. So 
new hunters weren't able to meet other like-minded new hunters or hunter education instructors and, and create that, that community, you know? So uh, we're, we're psyched about it. That sounds really good. Um, what do you think the state of conservation is gonna be through the fall? Like I know BHA, we've talked about, there's a project Matt DeBona clued us in on uh, that one of our college clubs is probably going to get after in terms of cleaning up some barbed wire. They can do that with face masks on from socially appropriate social distancing distances. Um, I'm picturing some public land projects in September being okay. Um, yeah. Do you think like small game hunting mentorship is going to be important through the yeah. fall months and is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we actually spoke with quite a few folks who did socially distant turkey hunts this spring. Um, and it was different and it was difficult and it required a lot more planning on the hunter's part, but they were able to do it. And I think that small game hunting is great social distancing because you shouldn't be right up against each other anyway when you're when you're going out walking, trying to flush a grouse, right? Like you should be quite a few feet apart. Um, so I think I think that'll be fantastic. Squirrel hunting too. I think I think that'll be great. And I think that as far as other conservation projects, I mean, here in Vermont, we still had Green Up Day, you know, and folks were just uh, really encouraged to do that in a responsible way with all the proper protective gear, wearing a mask. Um, staying six feet apart, wearing gloves, all that stuff. I, I really, and I really think that folks are good at adhering to those things too. I think people want to get back out there and get back to doing some normal things. And they understand that there are a few concessions that they've got to make in order to keep themselves and others safe, you know? So, um, so I really, I, I, you know, I think that we'll be continue with conservation projects and things are going to look different moving forward but it's going to be the new normal for a while and um you know we'll we'll make it work did you guys get anybody basically from the state it sounds like you work for the state right yeah i work for fish and wildlife so were they Vermont. trying to do anything as far as like changing seasons or some of the states I hunt, we were trying yeah. to restrict out of staters and all that. I'm curious if you guys had any of that type of stuff going on. Yeah, so we uh, we have a few, we have some guidelines for out of staters coming into Vermont on the um, Vermont Health Department website. Uh, I can actually find, uh, they've got a map uh, that um, talks about travel restrictions and who from what counties should quarantine for 14 days when they're coming into Vermont or seven days with a negative COVID test. Um, yeah, how do you, I'm curious how you guys feel about that, right? Because yeah, I see that, I guess it's okay if you're a protester and you can riot, but you can't go in the outdoors and uh, do outdoorsy fun stuff. Well, I think <laughs> you that- You know what I mean? Like, I'm curious on your take on all, some of that. You gotta be, of course you gotta follow the guidelines and all of that, you know, so. Right. Well, you know, I can't, I can't speak to that, but I do know that um, the <laughs> protesting that's happening, you know, that's a, that's a first amendment issue. Right. Um, so, so that's something really important to, to protect for, for us citizens. Um, well, and all these I'm, things all are the guidelines issue, right, though. for the cor yeah. coronavirus, right. These are all, these are all guidelines. Nothing is, is law. Like I don't right. think, get arrested for not wearing a mask no one's gonna stop you on the side of the road when you're coming into vermont but if you want to keep yourself and others protected and safe and you're trying to prevent a second spike um these are guidelines that that we that we want to follow and i and i'd suggest you know going to ask those questions to like department of health right um but uh as far as quarantining, um, our governor is asking uh, counties where there are more than 400 positive COVID cases per million residents to quarantine for 14 days when they get to Vermont if they're traveling 
from outside of Vermont to here before Makes they sense. go out, right? Or or have a negative COVID or or quarantine for seven days and then have a negative COVID test. Um, I'm really I'm really proud of the sportsman's community. Honestly, I was really proud of the turkey hunt community and the way that they were able to you know adapt to these new situations and these new realities and stuff. And I think. Um, you know, you saw a lot of groups really promoting that hashtag responsible recreation and, and really highlighting, um, you know, those, those ideas about social distancing. And, and, they, and I think, honestly, I think hunters and sportsmen, you know, we handled it really well and, and hopefully have been a model for, for other recreationists and stuff, you know, this spring and summer. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I think that it falls on the individuals to know what the rules are. And just like anything else, there's going to be rules, you know, right now there's rules that come out of the Department of Health that have to do with, you know, addressing some of the health concerns in the world. You know, it, it's the same thing in my mind as, you know, not not poaching animals or not littering or, or following all the other rules that we need to follow and, and being a, you know, you know, productive members of this community and setting a good example and whatever people in other communities do, whether they're following the rules or not, I, I don't think that anyone that's, you know, that's coming into state or traveling to hunt should be looking at, at that as something where they don't need to follow the rules because somebody else is. Um, I, I think it's on all of us to set a good example, not, not to sort of fall to the lowest common denominator. Right. We don't, we don't leave our, our worm buckets on the, side of the road or our leaders floating through the river you know it's all it's all taking care of people and taking care of each other and and so that we can hunt for the next 20 seasons you know let's not lose sight of the fact that we're we're in it just for this one season um, yeah. kind of off of what you just said though about worm buckets on the side of the road uh is one kind of on the fishing side of things is usually this time of year at all of our we have uh, ground crews out there that are picking up trash, maintaining them, those type of things. Uh, we don't have that this year because uh, uh, we usually rely on uh, the corrections crews, and right now they're not doing that. Uh, so you see, like, if you go to a lot of access areas, you'll see the grass has probably grown up a little bit in some of those areas. Uh, we are asking people, like, if you go there and you see trash on the ground, it'd be really nice if you go out and pick that up. So we're doing an RN when we're there. Uh, but if the public could also help us keep those areas clean, uh, that'd be really helpful. Because we do have, I don't know if any of you saw, but license sales for fishing right now are through the roof. We have a lot more people than, than usual that would be out fishing this time of year, which means uh, the access areas get a lot more use. Uh, so as a result, we unfortunately have some more trash than usual. Uh, so all that taking care of is important. Right. Vermont Fish and Wildlife has a an Instagram hashtag around that. And I know BHA, we've done the hashtag BHA COVID cleanup. So if, if anyone out there in the, the socials is, is watching, hashtag BHA COVID cleanup, uh, I, think, I think you might still win a prize. I'm not sure. Is that true? Giving away prizes for picking up trash. Yeah, that's and right. I'm also maybe going to call you a trash master. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, we're um, the uh, our local TU chapter is coordinating with uh, friends of the Mad River. This is getting the you know um, access area clean up, and we're just going to take uh, um, taking one of the local areas, and we're going to you know which gets in. An, it's basically the public beach as opposed to the fish and wildlife access, but um, you know we're trying to take care of that a couple times a week, and we're actually I think I'll probably stop in tomorrow morning because I'm sure there were. Um, even though people were hopefully socially distancing, you know, it was really jammed today, I suspect. Nice. Well, thanks for the cleanup, Clark. We, everyone appreciates it. And, and I think if you leave, if you just live by the rule of leaving places better than you found them, whether it's conservation or cleanup, we're all doing really good stuff. Um, yeah. We're, we're knocking on the door of eight o'clock. Does anyone have any last thoughts that they want to share? Uh, I just want to. I was going to add is, uh, in addition to the the hunter ed programs Nicole was talking about, uh, we do have some on the fishing side of things that will be coming up. Those are still in like the planning phase right now, but we're hopefully within the next week or two we'll be advertising those. Uh, they'll be a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Whereas like same issue we're running in with some of our hunter ed stuff is like doing uh, full full on clinics like we used to do isn't necessarily going to happen. 
uh, just due to the, some of the restrictions. So we're going to modify them a little bit. So it'll be a little bit different than what we're used to, uh, but I still think we'll have some pretty quality uh, programming. Nice. Thanks, Corey. Matt, you were going to say something? Yeah, I just, I just want to put in a plug. Um, next week, we'll be doing a, a Facebook live stream on the NWTF Vermont website talking about all things food plots. Um, so we'll be looking for uh, some information on that. And then uh, this time of year, um, I know that, that depending on what state you live in, it's already started in, in Vermont. It'll start in August, but Massachusetts and New Hampshire has already started is the summer turkey brood surveys. Um, so for those of you that are driving out and about and seeing turkeys, uh, whether it's gobblers or hens with or without poults, um, you know, please report them to your, uh, your state fish and wildlife website. If you go to the homepage of your respective state agency, you'll probably see a link for reporting sightings. Um, and one last thing is uh, NWTF Vermont's going to be doing another hunter effort survey via Facebook. Uh, we'll be putting that out um, probably next week. It's just a, it's a great way for us to get some quick and dirty data on hunter participation and effort. Um, it's something we've done the last couple of years um, and it really helps to um, maybe help explain harvest trends, um, you know, previous production trends, that sort of thing. So I encourage you guys to participate in that as well if you were a turkey hunter in Vermont this past spring. And that's uh, that's all I got, Matt. All right. Thanks, Matt. That's great. Uh, on the BHA side, we've got some few a few things going, and then I'll get to you, Nicole. Um, the biggest one is next week we have Rich Malloy uh, on another Zoom call uh, who's, who's big into the game prep stuff. So um, make sure you check that out. And then, Nicole, go ahead. What? What was the last thing you were going to share? You're going to get the last word. No, <laughs> I was. I just wanted to say that I put the um, COVID map for travel in the link in the chat. That's the mm. Vermont Department of Health. Um, and both me and Clark put the Vermont State Parks um, COVID yeah. guidelines link in the chat for, for, for state parks. And I see that um, Clark also put uh, Trout Camp for next for next year in the chat. Thanks for bringing that up too. Yeah, so for those of you that don't know, it's a camp for 13 to 16 year olds that uh, takes place up at Jackson Lodge uh, in Canaan, Vermont. And we had to cancel it this year. Uh, TU has lots of these camps around the country. Most of them were canceled and it was gonna be our 10th. Uh, so we're really disappointed that we weren't able to do it, but um, yeah. you know, we're really looking forward to next year. So, you know, uh, think about, uh, uh, your own family, uh, other, you know, extended families, uh, friends, um, kids that you know that might want to go and um, vet uh, great kids. And, um, and and it's a fantastic place for kids to go and learn about uh, trout and conservation and uh, create a, um, also a, um, you know, new group of conservationists. Yeah, got to get out there to, to care about the landscape. All right, folks, we're going to wrap it up. Last thing, write your representative about the Great American Outdoors Act. Get them to pass it. It's big stuff. We're going to love it for the next 100 years. <laughs> All right, everyone. See you later. Have a good night. Thanks, Thank everybody.